I'm going to be talking to Kevin Byrne, who's an energy economist with SMP Global and an expert on Alberta's oil sands. I've been interviewing him for the better part of a decade. We're going to be talking about uh, how much oil sands extra supply there will be the rest of this decade. But what happens if a 1 million barrel a day pipeline is built to Prince Rupert and the oil sands producers have to fill that pipeline? Then what happens? Kevin, welcome to the interview. No, it's a pleasure to be here. It's good to see you again. Likewise. Uh, okay, so we, uh, if I remember our previous interviews and the, the reports of yours that I've read, approximately 500,000 to 600,000 barrels of new supply will be coming out of the oil sands between now and 2030. Have I got it right? Yeah, we, uh, we're we estimating about a half million barrels of growth between, say, 25 to 2030. So you can do your math on what that is by year. Okay. Now, you and I have talked a lot in interviews about the difference between the if, uh, the brownfield development, where you're essentially expanding step out, I think you called it, uh, from an existing facility, and how that lowers cost, maybe down to an average of $27 a barrel break even, which is very low. Um, so is, is all of the production that's coming between now and 2030 going to be that kind of production? Yeah, I think that's right. I think I'd break it up into three different categories for for your listeners. One is greenfield, right? So this is totally new infrastructure being built in the field, new facility, new roads, the whole deal. That's really what built the oil sands, those initial greenfields. And then at the time, many people had multiple phases, sometimes up to 14. And then reality was we are never probably going to build the 14. The brownfield would have been then the next increment out. So you have your initial phase greenfield, then phase two, you should bolt onto that and go out. What we've seen over, I'd say the last five, six years, really since, you know, the price graphs of 15 kind of, uh, the projects continued past that lower price point into the 17 to 18 and 2019 period is a emphasis and optimization. So growing production through creeping existing capacity, debottlenecking,s operational efficiencies, replacing older wells with newer wells. Um, things could be as much as reducing scheduled maintenance, more predictive maintenance. If you keep the facility running, uh, you can produce more oil for the same amount of energy, same amount of uh, footprint, basically. So that's what we have seen dominate, and that's what dominates our production growth over the next five years. Okay, so that gets us to 2030. And let's just hypothetical here and say that um, the Kearney government, uh, the federal government, uh, agrees that a pipeline to Prince Rupert should be one of the projects of national interest. It gets built, and let's say that it goes into service 2030, 2031. Now it has to be filled up with new supply from the oil sands. What is the source of that supply? Well, okay, a couple of things here. Our production forecast is half a million barrels of synthetic crude oil and bitumen. Bitumen doesn't get shipped. They blend it with light hydrocarbons. Uh, natural gas condensates dominate that. Uh, and so what would actually probably be shipped would be closer to about 700,000. So more volume that way. You now you're asking me, would they accelerate? What would they take to accelerate? I think one of the things is the um, the... The forecast or everybody whose forecast shows volumes running into pipeline egress issues. So can you solve that issue? And can I have confidence that issue will be solved? Otherwise, the consequence is I get a lower price. And so any investment I make actually diminishes the potential revenues my shareholders get. And so remove that constraint. It's so not only it has to be removed in the sense I believe it to be true. It will be online and I will have surplus. I think another one is how do Canadian climate policies impact the operations of my facility and what's the return on investment that could be impacted by both escalating carbon prices and stringency as well as things like the oil and gas limit. So these things are also kind of seen as investment barriers. Now to the degree that we peel those back, would they then take the opportunity to grow output. Now, I think one of the misconceptions is the money that sits in an oil sense company is perfect, is in the total control of that president and CEO. But we all work for someone, Mark. I do, you do, someone pays our bills, right? And I work for a fellow that trades their company, trades their equity in predominantly New York City, but also Toronto. And their interest is the maximization of the returns for themselves. So right now, I'd say in the prior decade, I'm giving you numbers for general upstream, Upstream had about a 5% re re return. It generally underperformed its peer group. 
this decade, the the emphasis on capital discipline because they didn't perform as well as a pre- previous uh, peer group has changed that. They're performing right quite well. Certainly, that's helped by higher oil prices. On average, that return is somewhere around 15%. So they're competing for capital by managing or making sure they return that about 15%. They can do other things on top of that, share buybacks, increase dividends, those sorts of things. So will that investment they would need to make erode that ROI? If it impacts that ROI, it really comes down to the shareholder's willingness to take lower returns vis-a-vis other opportunities that would give them the higher return. And right now we've seen the answer is probably not much. So they're going to be constrained. So it becomes down to can they grow within cash flow and maintain that ROI? I think they could probably grow a little bit faster based on and accelerate some of the optimizations, but larger step outs, that's going to be a little bit harder for them. So they need a number of barriers to be removed, both policy-wise, certainty that they're going to be removed for a prolonged period of time, not just one term of office. And then we have to deal with the fact that what does it do to my ROI? Okay, let's unpack some of this. The uh, the step outs that you're talking about after 2030, the question then becomes, do they attract capital or do they have to finance it themselves? If they have to do it themselves, then it slows things down. They don't have as, enough ac- as access to as much capital. All right. Uh, what about building new greenfield facilities? And I, these numbers may not make sense anymore, but as I remember them, Kevin, uh, it was $60 to $80 per barrel break even for a greenfield project. Is that still the case? I'd use roughly those. We think greenfields would be probably, well, this is a hard one to answer because it depends on the prevailing oil price. Because I think a lot of people need to understand a lot of the oil sands economics are are underpinned by some of the things they have to buy, which are influenced by the oil price. So they buy a lot of condensate. So the higher the oil price, the higher the condensate price because they track, the higher the break-evens. Similarly, gas prices. So those are major inputs into their cost structure, condensate and, and the gas prices. So in a higher price environment, those break-evens are higher. In a lower price environment, they fall down. But I think you can roughly use what you're saying. I'd say 55 bucks, you might be able to squeeze it off. But how many of those can you do at 55 bucks before the labor market gets tight? And then the upper bound, I'd say it's probably north of 80 bucks. Um, and then we're talking about WTI basis, and that's probably greenfield mine. And greenfield mines, you're looking at a 20-year build cycle, not just the physical construction, but the design, the feed, the regulatory process. I think that's just, you know, probably very, very unlikely. And it has associated other challenges such as tailings management. And, and so I just don't see that one happening. Smaller scale SAG Ds that are descaled and efficient, potentially. But more than uh, I think per- what would dominate here, operational excellence kind of projects, because they're very capital efficient. They can grow almost within the existing half cycle cost, which is what they're doing today. Could they accelerate that and maintain their ROI? Probably. Um, and then you get these step out brownfields, which would be a material acceleration. Those are capital, much more capital efficient than greenfields. Those are the things they would likely do. I don't see, I don't see greenfields being a, a super attractive. You do these other things first because they give you a bigger bang for your buck. Okay, how does that play into the construction of a, a new pipeline to Prince Rupert? Do you build the pipeline first? And, and then wait for the producers to invest in, in increased production with, and then fill up the pipeline? How does that work? Or it depends. Might- Pipe- pipelines typically would do an open season. So they would just announce, you know, based on conversations, they talk to the companies. We think there's enough demand company, company to fill a pipe. Will you sign a long-term commitment to take sp- space on that pipeline? So it's, it's just like condo sales. You know, a new condo goes up, they pre-sell. And they pre-sell to go to the bank like, look, I have you know 60% of this thing sold. I need you to finance the last 40%. And so it's the same thing. Typically, you do an open season. I think right now it's going to be a little bit of a chicken and the egg. Uh, would, I take, would I take a position on that not knowing the rest of the policies are clear? So I, like the way I think about the Western Canadian Sedimentary Basin right now is the we're in a little bit of purgatory. We have a new liberal government that's come in. They've said some things around industrial policy, around project concierge treatment to accelerate that process. So we're getting some clarity around actual regulatory process. What's the expectation as it relates to the industrial carbon price? And what's it relate to the oil and gas emission limit? These things are questions that are unanswered. And uncertainty means, you know, and we're not talking about waiting years here. 
what's it going to look like? So I think we're going to see a little bit of waiting to see what that clarity is and what's the confidence in that policy announcement. Will it will it endure? I actually think those are the biggest immediate things before anybody would look at anything creative. Okay, so if I understand this correctly, the uh, the federal government has their. I mean, the, 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 we know what the demands are. You know, uh, reform the uh, uh, environmental impact assessment act uh, and the ban on and tankers from the northwest BC. Yeah, on and on and on. There's like nine of them, I think. Pre uh, Premier Danielle Smith had. So that would be uh, getting regulatory certainty, if I understand you correctly, would be the first order of business. And then the question becomes the economics. I think so. And, okay. and then probably it comes down to what can I fiscally do within my existing uh, financial uh, constraints while preserving that ROI? And that's a function of the oil price too, right? So if the oil prices are strong, and certainly on the back end of the year, we see weaker prices. So it'll be harder in the back end of the year. But if they go strong, then you probably can have a scenario where they can accelerate investment. And I'd say they, they, they accelerate optimization kind of work. And then before you get to Brownfield, but you can grow, you probably could grow a little bit faster, right? And we are talking about the oil sands. We do have this other engine called the unconventionals in the Montney, which are growing. And we expect to grow as well. And while they're gas heavy, it means that the, what they produce is dominant, predominantly gas. They do produce some liquids, liquids as well. As well, right? And I think at this point, I was looking at the numbers the other day. It's like eighty to one hundred thousand barrels a day, as opposed uh, to no. <laughs> okay, eighty. Yeah, you, you've got a lot more condensate coming from them than that. Oh, okay. I got you. I was thinking crude oil. Yeah, but condensate on top of that would be. You know well, it number? goes, it's like this, I have to pull it out. I don't have it at my fingertips, Markham. Yeah, I'd say 400,000. 400, I'm going to spitball and say 400,000 um, barrels of condensate that flow back in Alberta, then get blended back in the oil sands, and then they get exported. So those things kind of get commingled and go out. Then you get some heavier condensates, and they some of that makes itself into the light pool. Um, and we call it light crude oil, but it's heavier condensate. Okay, so... My takeaway from this conversation is that there are a lot of moving parts. This is a, is pretty complex. And the simple demand for a pipeline is, I understand why the premier is doing it, but uh, is probably premature. There's a lot that has to be done um, to prepare the way if there's ever going to be uh, a pipeline built and oil sands expansion to fill the pipeline. Is that fair to say? I think there. I think yeah. I think it's fair to say we're doing a waiting game. Once we see some clarity, then this might be a a more interesting conversation because we're removing some of the bar barriers. I, I'd also make the uh, um, uh, uh, add that you know when we look at pipelines, we tend to stack them up. I do this too. We stack them up and go, how much do I got? And when's the line going to cross? And when do I run into trouble? Um, not all those lines are equal. And what I mean, there some are heavy, some are heavy, some are light. So that stack up isn't really accurate about when you get into trouble in terms of takeaway. But also, some of them go to different markets, and the you know the 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 uh, the attractiveness of those pipelines varies from an operator in profit maximization perspective. And then we have this conception we should run pipelines at ninety five percent out of Western Canada. That is. That is not done in most of the world because you need surplus capacity to have optionality for when things happen. Like one pipeline goes to one major refinery, the refinery has an upset for whatever reason, or just even a maintenance that should not cascade back up and affect your differential. You want stability in that differential. And the way you get that is have surplus pipeline export capacity, and that gives you optionality. And it's optionality that's really kind of the challenge that Canada's found itself in. Not only is it egress issues causing differentials to widen unnaturally, but the optionality has put Canada in a position where it has to export exclusively to the United States. And I don't want to be negative. That's been good for Canadians because it's given them security demand and U.S. refineries security supply. But it's also strategically maybe not in Canada's best interest at this point. Grist for another debate between you and I, Kevin. Sure. We'll we'll, we'll put it on the shelf for now. Kevin, thank you very much. Uh, this, uh, In your usual technical economics uh, economist way, uh, you've shed a lot of light on the issue around a pipeline and what would happen at, or have to happen in the oil sense. So thank you very much for this. No, it's a pleasure. It's good seeing you again.